Hello, my name is Malcolm Greenbaum and welcome to this session on the effect of changing tax rates on deferred tax. Now, uh, deferred tax is designed, at least partly, to try to equalise, level out the tax, the effective tax rate shown in the accounting profit and loss account. And you can perhaps see this best by the um, first example we'll look at. So let's assume that there's a 19% corporation tax rate throughout here, and that it's a fairly simple company, it's got a profit before tax, it's got some depreciation, it's got some capital ounces, so its accounting profit for the year is 1100 but its tax profit is only 1000 So if we book deferred tax, then uh, we have the current tax charge on the taxable profit of 1000 that's 190 but then we have the deferred tax on the extra timing difference of 100 because the capital allowances uh, are greater than the uh, depreciation. So we end up with a deferred tax expense of 19, and that gives us a total tax expense of 209. As a percentage of the accounting profit of 1100, uh, the 209 tax expense represents an effective rate of 19%, in other words, the statutory rate for that period. If we didn't book deferred tax, then the tax expense would be limited to the current tax amount of 190, which means that the effective tax rate shown by the P&L would have a tax expense of 190 on a profit in the accounts of 1100, uh, giving us a 17.3% uh, effective tax rate. Looking a bit odd, therefore, and you need to explain that away where relevant in a tax reconciliation. Now, Things to remember here, well, FRS 105, uh, one of the possible accounting mechanisms in the UK uh, for micro entities, that doesn't allow you to book deferred tax. It's just not permitted. So you'd end up with the second scenario here. Whereas FRS 102 and RFS both require you to book deferred tax on temporary or timing differences, and therefore you'd end up with this lovely effective tax rate as shown here. For the purpose of our illustrations today, we're going to have a look at a couple of um, examples. So the first one will be pension cost expense, because from a corporate perspective, that's only deductible as an expense when it's actually been paid by the company. Whereas, of course, from an accounting perspective, we would accrue any pension costs that relate to the period. The second example we'll look at deals with accelerated capital allowances. We're going to assume that there's a 100% um, AIA that's available and that the company will depreciate at a different rate to that because of course depreciation is set by the directors it's designed to write off the cost of the asset over its use for life in the accounts uh, and it's very subjective that directors decide the appropriate policy and the appropriate method therefore to use so we'll look at both of those scenarios let's start with an example dealing with pension costs Let's assume that we have a company that has a March year end and accrues uh, its March 2020 defined contribution um, pension cost of 10,000. And after accruing that cost, it has an accounting profit of 200,000 pounds. And we'll assume there are no other tax adjustments that are needed and that this pension contribution will be paid um, in the following month and it will become tax deductible in that month. So part of the year ended 31st of March 2021. Now, first of all, we're going to assume a tax rate of 19% forever in this example. And I want to do is to show you what the P&L would look like if we used FRS 105, which doesn't allow us to book deferred tax, or return to the FRS 102, which does require it. The accounting profit before tax in both cases is going to be 200,000. Nothing changes that. The tax profit, we have to add back the 10,000 of accrued pension costs because they're not deductible this year. So we'll uh, charge current tax expense of 19% of 210,000. That's 39,900. We wouldn't book any deferred tax under FRS 105, but we would book a deferred tax asset and a credit to the tax expense under FRS 102 of 19% of 10,000 if we're assuming a 19% tax rate throughout. That would give us a total tax expense under 105 of 39,900 and under FRS 102 of 38,000. It gives a profit after tax in the accounts under 105 of 160,100 and a higher profit after tax in this example under FRS 102 of 162,000. If you work out the effective tax rate, taking the total tax expense as a percentage of the accounting profit before tax, we end up with an effective tax rate of 19.95% under FRS 105, even though the actual tax rate is 19% for the period. Whereas uh, under 102, by booking deferred tax, we end up with an effective tax rate of 19%. Now, 
next year, 2021 year, the deferred tax will be reversed out um, because the expense will become allowable for real tax purposes in the following period. But there might well be an accrued pension cost at the end of next year, which would need its own separate deferred tax to be booked on it. Now, in this example, it is worth noting how the profit after tax is, in our example, higher under FRS 102, smaller under FRS 105. So in this scenario, FRS 105 would give you a smaller distributable profit. So you couldn't justify as big a dividend as if you were using FRS 102. Now, we know, of course, that corporation tax rates are changing. Uh, that from April 2020, the corporation tax rate should fall to 17%. That was enacted quite a long time ago now. Now, for both FRS 102 and RFRS, we're told that we should use the tax rate applicable when the timing differences are, going, are expected to reverse. We must base that on the either the enacted or substantively enacted tax rates that exist at the year end that we're concerned with. Now, to be substantively enacted from a UK perspective, that's after the third reading of the bill in the House of Commons, the, the finance bill. In other jurisdictions, uh, we have to wait until it's actually enacted. There's no such concept as substantively uh, enacted. When tax rates change, it does therefore affect the amount of deferred tax we book that in turn affects the effective rate of tax, and that's going to make a tax reconciliation more difficult. And again, we'll look at uh, tax reconciliations in a different session. The effective tax rate in the first year also won't appear to make very much sense, as we'll see. If we take the previous example, but apl apply a live tax rate to or live tax rates to them, most things stay the same. The current tax rate is still 19%. That's still the rate of tax that applied for the year end March 2020. But because we expect the timing difference of £10,000 of pension costs to reverse in the following period, the year ended March 21, we know that the tax rate should be 17% for that period. And that's the rate at which we put deferred tax in this case. So in this case, the deferred tax asset and credit to P&L is only 1700 which means that under FRS 102, the total tax expense is now 38200 giving an effective rate of 19.1%. It's close to 19%, but it isn't 19%. Now, let's take a look at the situation with capital allowances. It's a bit more complicated because obviously capital allowances and depreciation reverse out over a much longer period of time than pension costs, which should reverse out in the next period. We know, of course, that the timing difference that we're looking at here is the difference between the book value for accounting purposes and the tax written down value, the original qualifying cost minus the capital allowances to date. Now, when tax rates change, what we really need to do here to get it exactly right is to actually forecast the reversals of those timing differences, which means forecasting the future depreciation and forecasting the future capital allowances or writing down allowances or, or other allowances on the assets that have already been purchased. And we also need to then apply the appropriate rates of tax that have been enacted to those reversals of timing differences for the periods to which they relate. Of course, in reality, we would consider materiality. If the difference is not going to be that material, we wouldn't waste hours and hours and hours of time trying to work out a more accurate deferred tax balance if it's not going to make an awful lot of difference to the users of those financial statements. But materiality in this context, you need to be a little bit careful with. Uh, we know that something is material if a primary user who's reading those financial statements wouldn't change their economic decisions if the numbers weren't quite right. They weren't right, but they weren't materially wrong. Now, in the case of an owner-managed business, a lot of the owner-managers rely on the company's profits to pay them dividends for their living costs. And therefore, even quite a small absolute change in the profit after tax would change the decision they would take over dividends they might declare and take as director shareholders. So therefore, in an owner-managed business context, materiality might be much smaller than you may uh, imagine. Let's take a, a simple example, just a single asset that qualifies for capital allowances. It was purchased on the 1st of January 16 at a cost of £80,000, and the company is going to depreciate it on a straight line basis over five years. So depreciation is going to be £16,000 a year. The company is going to make accounting profits after depreciation, after this 16 grand, of £100,000 for each of those next five years. And just initially, we'll assume a 20% tax rate so you can see the effect that deferred tax actually should have in the absence of tax rate changes. We'll assume that this £80,000 cost qualifies for 100% AIA. 
and we'll see how the PL would look for the next five years if we used FRS 105, so no deferred tax was booked, or alternatively, we used FRS 102. If we use FRS 105, we're only concerned with current taxation. We've got a profit before tax of £100,000 each year. Uh, that's net of £16,000 depreciation, which of course is disallowed for tax purposes. And we have an AIA uh, in the first year, capital allowance in the first year of 80000 So we have very low profits in the first year for tax purposes, thirty-six grand, and then 116000 for the other four years. This means that the current tax in the first year, assuming a 20% rate throughout, uh, is only 7200 uh, It's 23200 for the other four years. So therefore, the effective tax rate in the first year is only 7.2%. It gives a profit after tax of 92800 and, and that is essentially distributable profits. But then in the following years, we're going to have a profit of 116000 for tax purposes, or that's only a profit for accounting purposes of a hundred grand. So in the following years, we're going to have a much higher effective tax rate and a correspondingly smaller distributable profit after tax in this example. By applying deferred tax, we can level out the total tax expense as shown by the P&L. So the book value of the asset at the end of the first year after 16,000 depreciation is 64,000, then it goes down to 48, 32, 16, and then finally by the end of 2020, it is of course zero. The tax written down value at the end of the first year is zero. We've got all the allowances we're gonna get. We've claimed the whole cost as an AIA. So we get the timing differences for each of those uh, five years, and we recognize a deferred tax liability of 20% of that difference, that timing difference at the end of each year. Starting off with 12.8, then the difference is 9.6, then 6.4, and then 3.2, and finally zero. That's the balance sheet liability. The P&L expense or credit is the change in the liability from year to year. So at the end of the first year, we didn't have deferred tax at the start. So to create a liability of 12.8, we have to have an expense of 12.8. And then that liability gradually reduces by 3,200 a year. So we're going to debit liability for deferred tax and credit tax expense in the P&L with 3,200 for the remaining four years. This means that the total tax expense, both current and deferred added together, for each year is £20,000, which means on a profit before tax of 100000 we end up with a uh, profit after tax of 80,000 and an effective tax rate every year of 20%. That's what the deferred tax is doing here for the PL. Now let's look at an example where we use live rates of tax, where we know the rate was 20, went down to 19, is going to go down to 17 from 1st of uh, April 2020, and we'll see what difference it makes. It's exactly the same example, just using live tax rates. Looking at the solution to this, the tax profit is still the same and the tax, well, it's 20% the first year. Year end December 17 would have had three months at 20%, nine months at 19%, uh, an average rate of 19.25. Then it's 19% for the following two periods. And for the year end December 2020, it's three months at 19, nine months at 17, an average rate of 17.5%. So you can see the current tax expense is, is, is averaged at some sort of 19.25 uh, and 17.5% in certain periods. So without booking deferred tax, we still end up with quite widely varying effective tax rates, 7.2% the first year, um, considerably more in the remaining four years. And you can see that for each year, it's above 20% the effective tax rate, even though the statutory rate has come down to 17% by the end of 2020. If we start looking at deferred tax, the timing differences are exactly the same as before. 64,000 at the end of the first year, 48,000, 32,000, 16,000, and then zero. We then have to apply the appropriate amount of tax, deferred tax, to the reversal of timing differences each year. So we know at the end of 2016 that 16,000 pounds of that difference reverses next year, then 16,000 the following year, the following year, and the following year. And we know what the tax rates will be for those accounting periods. Accounting periods, 19 and a quarter percent from the current tax calculations, 19, 19, and finally 17 and a half. So we can book at the beginning because we know the tax rates, they've been, they've been put into law by the end of 16. We can book a deferred tax liability of 11,960. By the end of the second year, the first year's timing difference is gone. We're left with three further years to reverse. So deferred tax liability of 8,880, reducing then to 5,840, and then 2,800, and finally uh, eliminating down to zero by the end of 2020. So we can see the change in the deferred tax liability here 
is going to create a rather different PL tax effect. If we look at the total PL, we have a profit before tax each year of 100,000. We have current tax at 20%, 19.25%. Uh, 19%, 19%, and 17.5%. Then we have the deferred tax, creating the liability in the first year, so an expense of 11,960, and then reversing out each year by varying amounts from 3,080 through to 2,800, giving total tax expense in the first year of 19,160. Well, on a profit before tax of 100 grand, that's an effective rate of 19.16. It's a bit weird. For the remaining four years, the tax expense, 19,250, 19, 19, 17,500, is exactly equal to the statutory tax rates for those accounting periods. 19.25% in the year end December 17, 19% for each of the following two years, and 17.5% for the year end December 2020. So again, you can see the effect of accounting for the change in the tax rates within the deferred tax calculation is that while in the first year it looks a bit strange, in the reversal years it makes or helps, sorry, the tax expense in the PL to get close as close as it can to the um, statutory rate of tax when it's expressed as a percentage of the profit before tax. I hope you found the session uh, useful and interesting. Thank you for listening.